I'm afraid what I'm going to say now will sound rather cynical after this uh, wonderful presentation, because I'm going to talk about change. I looked at uh, the uh, home page of this conference and where it states the visions of this conference. And the visions are, we're supposed to find out how to rethink entertainment for social causes, all right? And how we can save the world through positive action. Well, I think we've seen an example of that just now. And all this in order to make the world better, safer, and more livable. I would like to introduce a critical uh, uh, thinking on this, because I would like to say that this is not very original today. Sorry. Well, who doesn't want to save the world nowadays? It's the motto of our times. Just imagine the consternation if someone were to say, uh, sorry, um, yes, if someone were to say, the world has never been a safer or more livable. In fact, it's never been better. Never. I will therefore devote my life to the preservation of the status quo. Just imagine what consternation would follow. Or he might even say, with Lord Salisbury, the British Prime Minister of the 1890s, Whatever happens will be for the worse, and therefore it is in our interest that as little should happen as possible. <laughs> well, I don't really think that statements like that would be taken seriously today, but once they were taken seriously, but not now. And certainly, if it, I'm a philosopher, and if this statement came from a philosopher, it would certainly be easy to dismiss and ignore, because as we all know, philosophers don't live in the real world. They live in ivory towers. So, still, the Prime Minister may have a point, I think, and I'll try to explain. Uh, despite all suffering in the world, which is there, of course, it is a fact that a great many people today enjoy a standard of living which would be unimaginable just a few generations ago. And in my own country, Norway, which is a privileged country, I admit, uh, it has been said that the middle class is now so affluent, so well off, that any change for them is bound to be a change for the worse. And still they cry for change. They want improvement, of course, because improvement is always possible. But they seem to forget that the required standard is already sky high. And uh, basically, they seem to forget a very basic law of, existis of existence, namely that life without suffering is impossible. So what they want is perfection. But to seek perfection is a very dangerous goal. History shows that. Also, I wonder, it, uh, why is change in itself a positive thing, a desirable thing, when, uh, in an age when there has been society change, dramatic society change, every single decade for the last hundred years, at least? Aren't we bored of change now? Isn't it frustrating when norms and best practices uh, change all the time? Wouldn't it be lovely with a period of stability and predictability for a change? <laughs> Rather than yet another transformation. Aren't we suffering from transformation fatigue? Are we or are we not? I don't know. Some, maybe. Of course, I realize that change is necessary and inevitable. It's, it's the principle of the universe. But why do we desire that which is necessary and inevitable? We don't desire death, do we? Death is necessary and inevitable as well. Uh, why do people devote their lives to changing the world when the world is bound to change anyway? Well, it's a fact, isn't it? It's a puzzling question, I think. Well, then there is the vision that entertainment should produce positive action. 
And let me just uh, tear that down as well. Uh, positive is certainly not a neutral word. It's loaded with cultural, uh, ideological, even metaphysical baggage. You know, what is positive? What is positive action for Stalin is probably not positive action for you and me. So, if the purpose of entertainment is to encourage positive social action, there is always the danger of turning entertainment into propaganda. There's a danger. And what's the opposite of propaganda? Well, I suggest that would be pure entertainment. That is, entertainment not as, not as a path to social change, but as a, a, a relief. Entertainment as a relief from the world, all worldly things. You know, entertainment just as amusement or mere distraction. And the danger here with that pure entertainment, that is, of course, escapism to get sucked into a fictional fantasy world and never find any way out of it. So, given that what I have been saying is correct, which it might not be, uh, we have two types of entertainment. Uh, entertainment as an instrument for external lens, social and political change, and the danger there is turning entertainment into propaganda. And then we have entertainment as a means to internal satisfaction. And by that I mean personal, psychological or emotional satisfaction. And the danger here is escapism. Do you remember Karl Marx? Yes, okay. He, was, he made a famous remark. He said, uh, many famous remarks, but one of them is that philosophy before him had been preoccupied with explaining and describing the world, while his philosophy aimed at changing the world. So he was a change maker, right? External ends, external goals were the most important for him. So I think it logically follows that if we think that entertainment, the prime uh, purpose of entertainment is social change, then we have a Marxist outlook, which is fine but we should be aware of it. On the other hand, pure entertainment, it's a difficult alternative, you know, because uh, mere distraction. W entertainment can be so much more than a time killer. And certainly, as educators, we would like entertainment to promote learning and personal development. We want to make kids socially aware and socially responsible, even philosophically conscious, by way of entertainment. But it's easier said than done, certainly. And why? Well, because we all love entertainment. We love to be entertained, kids and adults alike, I think. And why do we love it? Well, because it's the simplest way to escape boredom. I think it's as simple as that. Uh, when entertainment tickles our imagination, we're not, we don't care so much about the moral, aesthetical, or educational quality of the entertainment. We, we simply want to be amused. And soon the wow factor becomes the only criterion for good entertainment. The more wow, the easier we forget all the dull and difficult things in life. So, um, what can we do in this situation? How to get out of the escapist trap without automatically falling into the opposite trap, the save the world trap? Call it a trap, we can discuss that. But So, what I want to ask is meaningful entertainment possible that not only eliminates boredom, but also eliminates the perpetual craving for uh, excitement and Novelty. Is it possible? And let me propose then, that's, that's my clue, you know. I'm going to propose a very strange alternative, namely philosophy. Very strange. Uh, because philosophy does not rely on emotions or sensations, it relies on reason and judgment. 
it doesn't say, here we go, it doesn't say like the pure entertainment would say, if it turns me on, it's good. If it doesn't, it's bad. Rather, it says, if it makes me think, it's meaningful. If it doesn't, it's not. And of course, the premise here being that the discovery and creation of meaning is fun. And uh, that brings me to the title of my presentation, Philosophy as Evocative Fun. I would call that kind of the philosophical kind of fun is evocative fun. And what kind of fun is that? Uh, let me tell you about a philosophy club that I ran for kids. Here we had a girl, 10-year-old girl. She was very curious and intellectually playful. And then we had a session, a philosophy session. They can be boring sometimes, believe you me. And we had one such session. And um, what did she say? Well, she said the following. Although I found it difficult to philosophize tonight, I long for it <laughs> and hope it will happen again soon. <laughs> well, that's remarkable, isn't it? Here's a kid who's just experienced a boring philosophy session. And what does she say? Well, she looks forward to the next. Why wasn't she turned off? Why wasn't she afraid of being bored again? I think one possible explanation can be that she had become a lover of wisdom. You know, a true philosopher. In the philosophical search for meaning, she discovered parts of herself that she didn't even know existed. And certainly for her, philosophy was not just amusement or distraction, and it certainly was not about saving the world either. It was something deeper than that. Philosophy challenged her intellect and her emotions, and she loved this challenge. I think she loved the way philosophy forced her into a state of self-consciousness. I think so. For this girl, at least at this stage in her life, philosophy was more fun, really, than anything in the world. I know, I, I, I saw it. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to wait for that. Uh, yes, she loved this. Uh, and I think love and fun go together. Do you think so? No, not really. Well, <laughs> since we're in Italy, think of Romeo and Juliet. They lived in Verona. They were not bored. They were in love, you know? And I think love, like philosophy, is a deeper kind of fun. It's strange to call it fun, but I think it's fun in a way. But of course, uh, philosophers are rarely in love with each other, you know, like Romeo and Juliet. It happens, but it's very rare. Uh, they're more like Socrates. They're in love with truth and wisdom. You know, like Socrates and Plato. That's the, the ancient erotic, you know. It's about seeking truth and wisdom, the infinite. She, this girl, was smitten by this. And that's why she could experience a boring session and then automatically long for the next because she knew that the next time it could be different. So, the dis what we did in this philosophy club was having philosophical dialogue. And a distinguishing feature of this dialogue is that it combines contrasting uh, areas of competence. Have a look at this list. It combines innovation with structure and method, combines creativity with critique, impulsiveness with afterthought, and imagination or fantasy with logic. For example, when children are going to answer a philosophical question, they really enter completely unknown territory. It's difficult, you know, it's difficult for kids, it's difficult for adults as well. So, it's touch and go, we need to be creative and innovative. At the same time, in the philosophical dialogue, uh, we, um, 
the, the creativity and the impulse, impulsiveness, is constantly challenged and tempered by logical and critical follow-up questions. And this is really the essence of an intellectual process of discovery. An example here, we, I had a session with uh, a group of kids um, we were talking about what is a friend? What is a friend? Then we had a 12-year-old girl, and she proposed that friends must always be truthful. If they lie, they can't be my friends. You think this is a good idea? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty rigid idea, really. And, and, and the pupils, uh, her friends in the class, they started to laugh, because, not because they wanted to make fun of the girl, but because her idea was completely alien to them. You know? I, I asked the girls some follow-up questions. Don't you think it is normal for people to call their friends friends, although they're not always 100% truthful? Isn't it normal? Yes, it's normal, she said. And don't you also think that the border between truth and lie are sometimes blurred? You know, you have white lies, half-truths, omissions, things like that. No, 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 not to me. Never blurred to me. Well, this was getting strange. I asked her if she had any friends. Do you have any friends? Yes, of course. She said, lots of friends. And she said it in a way as if I had insulted her. And then she laughed because suddenly she realized that she was a bit touchy, perhaps, a little bit embarrassed, so she laughed. So I tried to ask her again, is it possible that your friends lie to you sometimes? No, it's not possible. Again, there was laughter in the classroom. I don't think the other pupils really believed her. It couldn't be possible, you know? At the same time, they realized that the girl had a point. Because what's the point of friendship if you can't trust the friends, you know? So, so, so uh, and, and this really puzzled them even more, because on the one hand, they couldn't believe her. She must have friends that have lied sometimes. On the other hand, what she said was true, in a way. So, all in all, it was an interesting, um, Strange, rather meaningful, and quite funny experience for both for the adult and for the kid, right? So let me um, wrap this up. Of course, media and technology will change in the future and will probably change beyond all recognition. But I don't think the essence of entertainment will change all that much. You know, as long as the seven deadly sins prey on the human heart. And one of those deadly sins is sloth, laziness, you know? As long as uh, that is a fact, we will always have a need for escapist carefree fun, no doubt. And no doubt there will always be political activists, or should I say political evangelists, that would like to turn entertainment into propaganda or some sort of change the world agenda. And fortunately, there will always be philosophy. And philosophy is never activist. Philosophy is never uh, escapist. No, it's evocative. And that means philosophy awakens the mind by challenge and surprise. Questions and answers. And certainly, philosophy can never promise to, to, shape, to save the world. But I think it may prevent us from becoming a media-consuming couch potato. Thank you. Thank you.